OK, um, just a quick point. Uh, if you want to follow the slides online while I give this, that bit.ly link down at the bottom, which is basically my name, Brett Cannon PyCon CA 2013. The slides are already up on PyCon presentation, so you can watch that way. And if you want to find me online, you can just go to bit.ly slash Brett Cannon. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to kick this straight off. So this talk is all about Python's uh, compiler. Uh, obviously, you probably don't really think about it, since the nice thing about Python is there's no specific compilation step. But there has to be a way to take the bytes you have representing code and somehow make that work in the VM. So this is going to be a fairly high level talk to just basically explain the steps that go, th go through to make that happen. So if you're not familiar with compilers and the typical steps and stuff, don't worry. I'm going to cover all those. Uh, I'll point out where in the standard library you can actually access a lot of this so that if you want to muck around with it, you're totally able to. So without further ado. Um, this presentation is based on a document called The Design of CPython's Compiler. Uh, it's part of the dev guide, so docs.python.org slash devguide slash compiler.html. Uh, I wrote that several years ago after we uh, actually implemented this compiler, because originally Python's approach, which I'll cover later, was a little simpler, but a heck of a lot bigger pain in the rear to use. Uh, so when we redid it, I wrote this document to help make it easier to expand. So that document actually has details on how to modify the C code and all that stuff. So if you really want to hack on stuff at the low, low level, you can have a look at that document. Uh, just to give a general overview of what I'll cover and how uh, the typical compiler in the world is structured, it basically breaks down to roughly five steps. Uh, so you have a decoding phase where you take the bytes off disk and you make it actual readable text. Uh, you got tokenizing where you basically take uh, the text and break it up into words. You got parsing where you take the words and then make sure that it's got some general, general structure like sentences. Uh, the AST, or the abstract syntax tree, which basically takes those structurally proper sentences and figures out what the heck you're saying. And then compiling, where you actually take that AST and make it into the bytecode that runs on the CPython VM. Uh, you might sometimes hear the term front end and back end when you hear about ARM, or good examples, PyPy, for instance. So the front end is basically getting all the way down to the AST, and the back end is taking the AST and combining it down to something. So PyPy has a front end for Python and back ends for like ARM, x86, et cetera. So first step, decoding. How the heck do you go from bytes in a file to actual text and those little letters we all love? It? Basically, it all comes down to just figuring out exactly what the encoding is. Uh, PEP263. Uh, has a, a specification of how you specify as a comment in the very first line of your source code what an encoding it, it, what the encoding is for the source code. Basically, it's uh, hash and then coding with either a colon or an equals, some amount of space if you want, and then you specify it. So you could say Latin one or Shift JS or whatever encoding you happen to choose to want that to be. Now, typically, it's advised that you don't change the encoding based on what the default is, uh, which I'll cover in a second. Uh, but for, if you have your reasons, you have your reasons, and it is supported in Python. Um, now, as of PEP 3120, uh, the default encoding for Python switched in Python 3 to UTF-8. Uh, we realize there are a lot more languages out there than just ASCII, which is what Python 2 defaults to. So as of Python 3, you don't have to really worry about it. Just save everything in UTF-8. You can represent whatever the heck you want, and you're all good to go. Now, along with this, this also empowered PEP 3131, which also allowed in Python 3 non ASCII identifiers. So if you want to use a certain subset of the Unicode BMP, uh, so lots of accented characters, et cetera, you can actually use that. So for instance, if you want to use French with accented characters in your variable names, you can actually do that thanks to PEP 3131 in Python 3. Uh, in terms of the standard library, if you want to be able to take a random bytes and actually get back readable text, uh, there's two ways. Uh, in Python 3.4, there's going to be a function, import lib.util.decode under source. Uh, you basically just pass in the raw bytes, and it'll just pass you back a string object with everything properly decoded. Uh, the old way before 3.4 comes out um, is tokenize.detect under encoding. Uh, I personally hate that function. It's got a horrible API. I did not design it. Uh, 
basically it takes a function uh, of the read line object for a file, right? So literally, like file.readline is what you pass in, and it does a bunch of things. It reads the first two lines to ignore a potential shebang. It looks for the coding line. If it doesn't find it, it returns those two lines, but now you file a sync two, two positions, and so now you've got to care about the two lines it may have returned while looking for something. It's a mess. So less than 3.4, the easier function. But it's there if you want it. Uh, so at this point, we have our text, right? So that's good. We just got a bunch of characters, but we kind of don't want to work with just a bunch of characters. We want to be able to break these things up into pieces. So you do what you call is tokenizing, where basically you break things into tokens, which is just a fancy word for words. So how do you, break, how do you know where to break a word, right? Like in the English language, it's based on a space. But for programs, that doesn't make sense, right? If you do y equals x plus 3, and you don't follow pep8, and everything's crunched together, how do you know where y is, what the equals, that there's an equal sign, that there's a x, there's a plus sign, and there's a 3? How do you break all that up? For example, right? So x equals 3 plus 2. You need a way to actually be able to break x equals 3 plus and 2 into separate bits, because they all represent something different. Well, thanks to the tokenized library, we have a way to do that. So basically, as you all know, for instance, variable names have naming rules. They have to start with a letter or an underscore, and then they can be followed by a letter, underscore, or a number. All right? Well, you just start following rules while you, well, you read text to tokenize and just make sure that the rules match. So, OK, you, first letter, the first character you come across, is that one of those, does that, is it an underscore or a letter? Yes, OK, so it's going to be a variable name. Keep going until you find something that's not an underscore, number, or letter. Stop. That's your first token. Next thing, oh, look, it's an equals. Well, that's a reserved constant, right, in Python. You can't use that in anything. So that becomes its own token, equals. Uh, pass that. What's the first thing you come across? Oh, look, it's a digit. OK, so now it's a number. And if you notice here, everything gets broken down based on uh, row, row and column, right? So this is row, row 1, column 0 to row 1. Column 1 gives you x, which is a name figures out, oh, look, there's equal. Now we have a number. Now we have plus. Now we have a number. Now we have new line. Now, in this instance, this is just what the tokens kind of are. They don't have any semantic representation. Number doesn't really mean anything to the tokenizer. It's just, oh, we happen to know this is a number based on what the letters happen to be. Now, in the standard library, there's two places to look for actually working with the tokenizer. Um, tokenize, I know, crazy name, um, which will actually give you this output if you use it from the command line with dash m, uh, and other ways to get the stream of tokens. Uh, there's also the keyword module, which lists every single solitary keyword in Python, so if, with, plus, minus, all that stuff. Now, once you've broken up everything into words, you kind of care about your sentence structure, right? Is there an adjective and a noun? Is everything following grammatical rules? Now, it doesn't have to necessarily make sense. Like, you don't necessarily... Don't necessarily expect a dog to be purple, but that's still a semantic, that's still an accurate sentence structurally to say the dog is purple. So parsing just makes sure that adjectives, nouns, and et cetera are all in the right place in a sentence. So the way grammar is specified in a language, and in Python's case, it's in a file if you look in the, the code checkout in grammar slash grammar, is in a grammar file. Now in Python's case, it uses something called Extended Bauer Nor form, or EBNF, or sorry, Bacchus Nor. And it's kind of a funky regex bastardization that specifies simply what rules have to be followed in order to be able to take the words and verify that things are structured the way they have to be structured. So in the case of a past statement, we have a statement, okay? It can either be a simple statement or a compound statement. All right, well, what's a simple statement? Well, a simple statement's a small statement optionally with a semicolon and another small statement, maybe another semicolon at the end of the line, and a new line, OK? What about a small statement? Well, it could be expression, a delete, a pass, a flow, an import, a global, non-local, or an assert. And then, as you can see, it just keeps breaking down more and more to, into lower and lower details, where in the end, you get to the past statement. If you look at del statement, for instance, just above it, it's the keyword del with some expression. All very straightforward. But the whole point is, is the whole thing breaks down in a way such that you just go from rule to rule to rule, right? So you just start from the big rule and just figure out your way somehow down all these little rules in the 
way, that one, and all the way down. And what that ends up giving you is a huge nested tuple of what those rules were that it took to get down to that statement. So in the case of pass, uh, number 268 in the grammar happens to correspond to statement. 269 corresponds to simple statement, 270 to small statement, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to pass. So what this ends up giving you is a con concrete syntax tree. So like if this was a mathematical equation, such as 3 plus 2, you end up with this nested structure, right, where, okay, you have a, uh, the Aerith expert rule, which contains a term, which happens to be a factor, which happens to be a power, which happens to be an atom, which happens to be the number three. There's also a plus in an, in a, in an arithmetic expression. And then another number, which also is considered an atom, considered a power, considered a factor, considered a term. Uh, and one interesting thing to note here, if you notice the order of term, factor, power, atom, uh, if you think mathematically about how Python specifies uh, precedence of operators, you know power is applied first before multiplication, before a plus. That's all actually through the grammar by specifying, oh, look, something that's considered a power is more tightly bound to what's being worked with than factor is, than what term is, because factor is multiplication and term's addition. Now, originally, Python worked with this structure, and you can look, it's okay, you kind of get the concept, oh, okay, there's a number and there's a plus and there's some arithmetic. You kind of have to work through a lot of cruff, like you don't care about the term, factor, power, atom bit is. So up until Python 2.6, this is what Python mostly worked with at the compiler level. But I'll get back, I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, for any of you who are really interested in parsing, technically Python's grammar is an LL1 grammar. Uh, it's probably the oldest piece of code in Python today. Uh, it basically has gone virtually unchanged since Guido wrote it way back in December of 1989, uh, using the original uh, Red Dragon book from the compiler's uh, world, which apparently now has a new cover which doesn't even have a Red Dragon, so I don't know why they changed it, because everyone knew it as the Dragon book, but what do I know? I'm not a publisher. Uh, in terms of what LL1 means, uh, basically it means that the grammar goes top down, so it goes, as it's earlier, Statement, simple statement, small statement, parses that way. The bigger way down, instead of going number to, instead of going from like number to atom to power to whatever. And the one means the grammar only looks ahead one token to try to figure out what it needs to do. So what you can do is you can get these really, really fancy ways to try to specify, okay, I need to figure out what this token represents but I can't figure it out without looking so many, so many tokens ahead of time. By limiting it to one, we keep it fast and we keep it simple. Because if you allow yourself to look too far ahead, you can get really complicated rules. And I can't name anything because it might be viewed as bashing. But uh, <laughs> if you keep it short, it's much, it really restricts the grammar so that you really force yourself to keep things clean and simple. And on top of it, it also makes it a lot faster. If you don't have to look so far ahead, there's no backtracking, right? If you look too ahead, it's like, I think it might be that. Oh, no, it's not that. What about this? What about this? Um, because all this is driven by a big, big table where you just go, the current token is this. What's the next one? Oh, it's that one. OK, that says go to this rule. So then you go to the next rule and through. So by keeping it one, Python's compiler stays quick and fast and parses quickly, which means you don't have to have a compilation step when you actually code. Now, in terms of accessing all this, there's the parser module, which will give you that big tuple of numbers. There's also the symbol table and the token table. Uh, sorry, table. The symbol module and the token module. Uh, what these represent are what are called non-terminals and terminals. So terminals are things like numbers, plus, minus, whatever. Um, non-terminals are everything else. I do not know why they're separate modules. These are old modules. I would not have done it this way, but it's just the way it is. It's fairly easy to work with. You just have to realize that you have to check two different places based on what the parser module gives you back. But honestly, you shouldn't probably be working at this level. You should be working with the abstract, the abstract syntax tree. Uh, this was introduced in Python 2.6. So as long as you're not that far back, you get to use this. Um, and this is basically where you take set and structure and make sure that it makes sense, right? The dog is purple. It's structurally correct, but no dog's going to be purple purple unless you torture your dog and dye it a color purple. 
So you really want to care if it's a brown or yellow or black or whatever. Uh, interesting fact, uh, Jeremy Hilton started this project to add an abstract syntax tree to Python because it's very traditional and easier to work with, as you'll see. Uh, but he kind of stalled on the work. And at PyCon in Addison, Texas, which I believe would have been 2006, uh, Guido gave the ultimatum, if you don't get this done in a year, you're going to have to uh, give it up, and it's never going to happen. So a couple of us bound, bounded together and actually got it done, and this is how it ended up in Python 2.6. Basically, Guido saying, do it or go away. So uh, that's a syntax tree specified using what's called the Zephyr abstract, abstract syntax definition language. And basically, it's just it was basically a paper from academia that's kind of tried to standardize the language of specifying how abstract syntax trees could be represented. So in this case, this is um, part of what it would take to represent an expression, right? So you can have a Boolean operator, boolop, you could have a bin, binary operator, or unary operator, lambda, if expression, et cetera, et cetera. And the names are very obvious, right? Like a Boolean operator is going to have the operator and some number of expressions. A binary operator is going to have a left side and an operator, and then a right side. I mean, it's much cleaner and obvious how this works compared to working with the, the concrete syntax tree. It's not a bunch of random numbers and nesting. It's just very upfront. This is the left, so two plus three. And visually, I mean, it basically is literally just a tree and breaks down to the exact way you would think, right? So the assign node for equals has a target of x and a value of what happens to be a binary operator of plus with a left side of three and a right side of two. I mean, you can easily imagine how you would take a structure like this and make it into some bytecode to do the right thing. Um, and this is how it actually comes out. And as you can see, it's actually fairly readable. It's not at all bad like the uh, concrete syntax tree, which is just a tuple of numbers. It's actual objects with reasonable names, like a sign with attributes of targets and value and left and op, with objects need to add to represent addition. It's very, very clean and easy to work with. And if you really ever want to muck with things to this level, this is definitely the level you want to work at. This is how people have tried to add macros to Python, for instance. Uh, Victor Sinner has written some code to do AST optimizations. I've used this to minify Python code. This is the level you really want to work with if you really want to try to take Python code and do some tweaking before you generate your uh, bytecode. Uh, where it's in the standard lab, it's in S, uh, AST. Uh, this gives you direct access to the exact objects that the compiler uses. There's actually code that actually auto-generates the Python code from the C definition, so there's literally no difference. The C code actually reads those Python objects back in, so it's very one-to-one -one mapping and very easy to work with. Now, working with it, as I kept, keep claiming, is simple. Uh, so to, not, to prove it, this is enough code, honestly, to print out uh, x equals 3 plus 2, uh, semicolon y equals 4, in a way that makes pep8 happy. It's basically just a bunch of rules that say, OK, if you get an assigned statement, you know what? You need to look at what the targets are, print them out, print an equal sign with some space around it, and then just keep printing things out as you need, and just add a visit function for every, or function, a visit method for everything. So if you need to add subtraction, just add a visit subtract. And you would just do the right thing, and it just falls right through. Very clean and easy to work with. So the last step in all this is compiling. How the heck do we get this AST down to some bytecode? Uh, a couple quick points about bytecode. It's considered a CPython implementation detail. So do not ever expect it not to change. We change it about every uh, minor version or feature release, depending on what you want to call something from 3.3 .3 to 3.4. Uh, the bytecode for the VM is stack-based. Uh, it's not register-based. And there are 101 instructions. So this is definitely not a risk system. Uh, there are a lot of special bytecodes for a lot of special reasons. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of what it looks like. Um, so if you define the func uh, function with just x equals y plus 2, you end up loading the global y, because this is obviously a global variable, not a local. Uh, you load the const 2. Uh, those are now both on the stack. You do a binary add, which takes the two items off the top of the stack and adds them, pushes it back down. You now store that into x. 
Uh, and because all functions and methods in Python return none, you load the const none and return that value just in case you don't hit any returns before then. Uh, and the final step in all this is basically taking uh, your bytecode in block form, so exactly what you think blocks, like blocks of an if statement or functions, whatever, and you create what's called a control flow graph, which basically is a graph of bytecode blocks where edges are where jumps would happen in the code, like, okay, if this statement is false, I need to jump to this if else, uh, this LF or this else or somewhere else. And basically, it's a three-step process to go from here to your final bytecode. You take your individual little blocks of bytecode and figure out the scoping for each variable. Compile all the bytecode without any jumps calculated, because you might need a shift order and stuff. And then you finally just flatten the whole thing in a big list of bytes, figure out where your jumps were supposed to be, and just fill in the details. Uh, the very last step after compiling to bytecode is to run it through what's called the ppolar, which is a little op uh, optimizer for bytecode. Uh, only to single, simple transformations within only a single block. So it's really, really fast, which is why it's always run. Uh, for instance, it'll optimize 3 plus 2, because it knows it's a constant plus a constant, and that's a constant answer, so it'll just make it 5. Um, it, because it's only simple, we, you never extend anything, so it's really clean and fast. And as I said, you always use it because it's so quick. Uh, in terms of compilation, there's always the built-in compile method, or mot function. Uh, there's the disk module if you want to look at the bytecode. Uh, and if you are interested in more bytecode, uh, Larry Hastings gave a good talk at uh, PyCon US this past year in 2013 that I'd recommend looking at. And then there's the syn table uh, module, which helps you figure out the scoping of variables. So just a quick recap. Decoding, bytes to text, tokenizing, text to words, parsing, where's the sentence structure, AST sentence structure to actual semantics, and then compiling semantics to what the heck you actually make Python work. And that is it. And, Joe.